I don't know what brought me down to the docks at that hour. I guess I was looking for something. Something unknown. You know, it's all bull crap. They're not real? <laughs> oh, they're real. Nah. This whole idea that sharks must be killed. It's bull crap. I know. I was there when it started. My father started out catching sharks for a living. That's how he sold charters to support his family. But as the thing became so popular, that idea wasn't sustainable. He realized that it, he had set the wrong example. Frank Mundus wasn't the first person to catch a shark, but he was the first man to make shark fishing popular. The sharks outlived Frank, as they have done every other prey for about 400 million years. They are the oldest surviving species on Earth. They saw the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. To sharks, humans are newcomers. The key to their longevity is their ability to adapt to their environment. Over 500 different types exist from small dwarf lantern sharks at seven inches to the whale shark at 50 feet. Humans have hunted sharks for 4,000 years. The Australian Aborigines made a food called Bundahar from the shark meat and liver. In the 1920s, demand grew for shark oil as a source for vitamin A There's a fair oasis filled with smiling faces down in old Havana town. Every senior Interest in sport fishing gained popularity in the 1920s and 30s when men like Zane Gray and Ernest Hemingway traveled the world in search of massive swordfish, tuna, and marlin. These anglers never thought of trying to catch a shark. The shark was their enemy, as it often ate the catch before it got in the boat. I saw the harbor lights. They only told me. Montauk was promoted to the wealthy as a location for big game fishing by developer Carl Fisher. But it was the working class that really found the fish. The Long Island Railroad promoted the Fisherman Special Express from New York City to Montauk for $1.50. Boats awaited the eager anglers looking for blues and bass. This service grew so fast the railroad had to send agents to the Jersey Shore to recruit more boats and captains. It was one such agent 
that convinced a young Frank Mundus to load his family on his boat and head to Montauk. My mother and my sister and my father lived on board and he would fish during the day. My mother would push the baby carriage around all day and get lost in Montauk somewhere. And after the boat was cleaned up at the end of the day, she'd move on board, back, make dinner, sleep, get up, leave the boat again. That, that's what they did all summer long. And he, in the beginning, did what the fishermen special wanted, bass and bluefish, inshore fishing. And he didn't really, he was kind of bored with it. Um, it was like a cattle call. He discovered sort of by accident, because he was trying to do this chumming thing where they would chum for bass and bluefish, but all these small sharks kept coming up in the chum slick. And he realized that his customers loved that. At first, nobody wanted to go shark fishing. It was considered a trash fish. Mundus coined the phrase monster fishing to attract attention, believe me. When people hooked into a shock, they knew they was alive. <laughs> you know, he had this idea, because he saw all the private boats catering to the movie stars, but they were all after billfish. And he just realized that there was money in it. It was a supply and demand thing, so that's how it all started. In 1964, Frank Mundus caught a great white shark big enough to change how all sharks would be perceived in the future. In June of that year, he was on a charter off Montauk experiencing engine trouble. They had been chumming with his proprietary blend of whale meat when out from the deep appeared a true monster. Five harpoons, four barrels, one new water pump, and five hours later, they were able to get a tail rope on the biggest great white shark ever caught. When landed in Montauk, news of the fish flashed across the world. One of the persons to read about the mammoth shark was a struggling writer, Peter Benchley. With the idea to develop a story around great white sharks, Benchley chartered Mundus for a trip. And instead of fishing, mind him for stories. And I remember that day he, he came home from fishing and we're all sitting around the supper table and he said, you know, the weird thing is that today my charter party wasn't a party at all. It was just one guy and he didn't want to fish. He just wanted to drive around all day talking about fishing. Much of Mundus' stories ended up in the book, Jaws, which became an instant bestseller in 1974 and of course, the movie by Steven Spielberg a year later. No one was prepared for the shark killing frenzy that followed. The public's perception of sharks almost immediately changed from an ancient aquatic relic to that of a calculated human predator. The only good shark was now a dead shark. Human prey for sharks is a relatively new food for them. They're used to food that's been around for 20 million years, not us newcomer humans. They may bite to get a taste of what we are. A white shark's sensory system reflects their 400 million year evolution. They're one of the most evolved groups of animals on the planet. Their smell can detect minute traces of chemicals from miles away. Their lateral line system is used to detect vibrations made by prey and to orient the shark to begin predatory action. They also have ampullae of Lorenzini, which detects electrical currents generated by muscular activity. In 1972, the Montauk Marine Basin held its first shark fishing tournament. It reflected the public's perception of sharks as human predators. Other marinas followed with their own tournaments. Their popularity soared among spectators, 
looking to see the giant dead sharks on the docks. Big money was involved, with prizes approaching $700,000. Subconsciously, they wanted to believe they were the provider, an escape from their reality. The bigger the fight, the greater the victory. Frank hated the shark tournaments. He respected sharks and saw no need for the pointless overkill. Perhaps feeling responsible, he advocated shark conservation with tag and release tournaments. He even wrote a children's book about white sharks. In 2009, a few people began to question the ethics of killing all these sharks. Among them, artist April Gornick, who began protesting tournaments in Montauk. And I made a little poster myself, and I marched over there and stood in a semicircle with other protesters. Cars went by, and some of them honked, and some of them waved, and some of them gave us the finger, and then we all went home. And I thought, that's not enough. <laughs> this is not going to make a difference. It's not like there was no, there was no um, control over the way that these tournaments were done, and they were respectful, and the fishermen were like, how dare you get in our faces about this? I met this guy, Rav Friedel, who was with the Concerned Citizens of Montauk, and one of the people that he said was critical to speak to was this guy, Joe Gaviola. Joe, a lifelong shark fisherman out of Montauk, has won the world's largest shark fishing tournament three years in a row. And no matter how much protesting you do, you're not going to change this. You're not going to change these people's mindsets by just protesting. If you want to change and affect the fishery and protect the species, you need to start with circle hooks. And Frank Mundus had argued for circle hooks. He started promoting the tagging and releasing of sharks and the use of circle hooks. <laughs> circle hooks need to be in line, that is not off center, so that they would come evenly all the way around. J hooks, which lodge in the fish's stomach, were the preferred hook, but likely caused fatal damage, negating the purpose of releasing the shark. It's almost impossible to get this hook to stay in a shark's stomach. It would come up here, it would be right in his, in his lip and in his, in his jaw, and we would clip the wire right here if we, if we weren't going to bring him in, and this would rust out in about three days. There would basically be no harm to the fish. And Rav and uh, April uh, first came up with the idea of, with Carl Derenberg at Montauk Marine Basin of coming up with a full release tournament, only circle hooks, and it would be money, a money prize. O-Search, an organization that tags and tracks sharks, agreed to participate. O-Search came in specifically to be a part of the tournament, and we were very excited that we had these great, great people like Greg Skomal, who was a, is a shark-taking expert. He really knows how to handle them. Four sharks were tagged and named with their tracks posted on O-Search's website. This created an identity and empathy for the sharks. And it actually got a lot of notoriety. It, it made the um, Today Show, it made the NBC Nightly News. And what we proved in that tournament was that you could catch as many sharks with these circle hooks as you could with the J hooks. It was just a different way to fish. It is very difficult to determine shark populations. But most marine biologists agree certain species are in a sharp decline. Overfishing is considered the cause, along with climate change, pollution, and habitat destruction. China's refusal to ban shark fin soup remains the biggest obstacle. It was recently learned that Montauk is a crucial nursing area 
for juvenile white sharks. And it is believed that breeding takes place nearby. If the population is to rebuild, it starts here. Currently, circle hooks are mandatory for shark fishing in New York State and all federal waters. Today's shark tournaments require all landed sharks be of a minimum weight, significantly reducing the kill rate. U.S. waters are among the most regulated in the world for shark fishing, hopefully allowing the species to rebuild. So are you telling me that they are back?